episode of Experience Annex. Experience Annex is a platform for role models, thought leaders, legendary entrepreneurs, and world-class professionals to share their wisdom with the world. We are very excited to have Mr. Victor Fabio again on the platform, the HR Director of Najam Breweries. Today's episode, episode is going to be very exciting because with the economy knows diving seriously, any information to guide job seekers how to position themselves in the job market is what is worth in gold. No one is better placed to give this information than our guest today, Mr. Fabio Ibo, who was not too long ago the president of the Charter Institute of Personnel Management of Nigeria. Welcome, Mr. Fabio Ibo. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Pleasure. Mr. Fabio, can you tell us, just our audience, a little bit about yourself? Again, uh, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Victor Fanwebo, Human Resource Director, Nigerian Breweries PRC. Uh, Nigerian Breweries is uh, one of the foremost Heineken operations, uh, easily the largest in Africa, and second uh, for Heineken worldwide. I have been working for Heineken now it's over 30 years, a little bit over 30 years. Before Heineken, I had worked six years post-university. So altogether, a career spanning 36 years post-qualification. I have a first degree in sociology, a second degree in public administration, another first degree in law, and I was enrolled as a barrister and solicitor of the Supreme Court of Nigeria uh, following my graduation from the Nigerian Law School. Um, in my 30 plus years of HR work experience for Heineken, I spent seven years in the Netherlands also working for Heineken on international assignments and I lived and worked with my family in the Netherlands. I have been back from the Netherlands now for seven years um, as Human Resource Director for one of the foremost multinationals in Nigeria. So in a nutshell, that's, that's me. Very fantastic. Uh, uh, from your profile, you joined Nigerian Breweries I think, in 1986. That is so, correct. I mean, how, I mean, how is it working in a one company for eight years? Fabulous. That's Fabulous. how I would describe it. Fabulous. Um, I mean, it can never be better than that. Because what that signifies is stability. Uh, what it means is uh, dedication to service, loyalty. It also means patience. It means um, uh, your ability to be broad based. Uh, working in one organization in different roles means you would have seen that organization inside out. And again, I think I have been very lucky. My experience has been very unique. My career path has been uh, one of the best that anybody can ever wish for. Uh, there has never been a dull moment. I, I have been uh, in the HR space in every sphere of HR that you can imagine. And that means my experience as an HR practitioner is indeed very broad. And uh, fortunately, this was also laced with seven year international experience working in a fabulous country like the Netherlands where systems and processes are highly developed. So, I mean, for me all together it's been a very, very rewarding 30 years of, of core HR experience and I'm, I'm really glad. So, 30 good years, 1986 mm -hmm. to 2016, yeah. how has the company and industry changed over these years? Well, it, 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 has, it has come a long way. I mean, 30 years ago, you can imagine um, how 
small in size even this business was compared to what it is today. I mean, it has grown in leaps and bounds. You can also imagine how we have, over the years, fine-tuned the system, the processes, uh, how we have grown from a near manual operation to what I will refer to today as highly automated, even in our HR uh, systems and processes. It's, it's like comparing night and day, to be honest. It's, um, it's, it's come of age. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. So uh, let's jump straight to CIPM, okay. which you led as a president in 2013 2014. That's correct. Yes. Okay. So your tenure as the president of the CIPM really brought a lot of changes, brought the CPI, uh, CIPM to I mean, national prominence. What did you do differently that others did not actually do? Well, I, I was president, thank God, of the CIPM from 2013 to 2015, so a two-year two uh, uh, tenure as president. And I think these were two glorious years. If, you, if I come to your question of what did I do differently, well, again, I, th I think what I did was to build significantly on the legacy that I inherited. Uh, two, three presidents before me have started the CIPM on a new journey. And what I, what I, what I did was to, to give it speed, to, to accelerate the pace of that newness, uh, to renew the structure, to renew the system, to find a way of, of bringing practitioners of HR back to where they belong. Because before then, what I found was that there were so many senior practitioners, HR practitioners, who were out there um, and who just didn't feel like CIPM was the umbrella under which they wanted to practice. And I recognized very, very quickly into my, uh, my leadership that what we had to do was to offer our game. What we had to do was to develop the offerings in a way that senior practitioners would feel like there was something for them to benefit, something uh, attractive from the offerings from the CIPM. We worked on the brand of the CIPM. Uh, we kind of pushed it to the edge to, to bring it uh, out of its, its sleepy environment and, and give it traction, give it, um, uh, you know, renew the brand image, more or less. And we got people interested. So many people wanted to jump on board immediately, and they did. But we also very carefully, without compromising on, on quality of our membership, we, we created the opportunities for senior practitioners to, be, to come on board without having to go through the rigors of writing the examination as if they were newcomers into the world of work. So we created a practitioner's route to entry. We created even an executive route to entry. So people who were already senior in the organization um, found an easy way to get into the CIP and without having to go and start from nothing. And they could come in as full member. And I think this was very attractive. But also in terms of the programs, uh, we, we worked on this. We tried to bring it to international standards. I remember uh, I brought with me uh, a team to, to the shrimp, the the Society for Human Resource Managers in the U.S. to their annual conference uh, where I charged the team to go in there and copy without shame. Uh, and that we don't have to come to the CIP and trying to reinvent the wheel. Let us just benchmark ourselves uh, to highly reputable um, HR bodies like Shrim, like CIPD, and let us go out there and look at what they do right. Copy it and come back 
localize it a bit, give it that local flavor, and there you go. And that really, it really helped tremendously. And it became the talk of town. Again, we also gave a lot of publicity. Um, so our events that we had in the past, uh, in the corner of a room, and nobody knew about it, we, we brought it to the fore. We were on television, we were on radio, we were in the print media, and before you knew it, it really gathered momentum, and everybody wanted to be part of the CID. And so that's uh, in the nutshell was how I learned the CID. Yes, so, yeah. and then, at the end, then when maybe they are sent, you become maybe president or chairman of the association, I'm sure they are copying what they have done <laughs> for the CID. So, um, the CID, is it only for HR practitioners or some people in other um, uh, functions to benefit from membership? Well, I mean, strictly speaking, because we are chartered as a body, um, and there are, there are criteria for becoming member of the CIPM. But that is about membership. But in terms of offering, we also made our programs attractive enough for non-CIPM members, uh, for them to benefit from it, for them to be educated, to create awareness. Uh, we had public service programs that were not targeted at only uh, HR practitioners, but uh, business leaders, uh, line managers, and the rest of uh, the crew working. We try to appeal to everybody in the world of work. Uh, and we try also to generate interest so that those who are also not working in the HR space become curious and you never know, some of them uh, come making inquiries, how can I belong to this body? And then we put them through our examination and before you know it, uh, they found their comfort or they find their comfort in, in the HR world. Yeah, and like the fact indeed the uh, CITM conferences is the uh, Myanmar conferences that uh, place to be. Everybody that makes it see what the, the entire room, I mean, all is always filled up with this. Absolutely. Because of what we did. Okay, you, you talked about benchmarking. Yeah. Um, let's bring it look at the public sector because in, um, well, it's really unfortunate that most of the public sector institutions in Nigeria are not really working well. I'm taking an example of ASCON, the Academy Star College of Nigeria. The CMD, the, the Center for Management Development, and um, NISA, the Center of Social and Community Research. Mm -hmm. um, um, the, the, I mean, there's um, this come, I mean, sorry, institutions were set up and benchmarked against the best in the world, like NCA was benchmarked against them. Uh, I mean, CMD was benchmarked against them. NCA in France, mm -hmm. yet, and perhaps are not really, what can really be done to these public institutions in Nigeria to? I think, I think it's about keeping the focus and staying, staying with your agenda, uh, the reason for your existence, uh, not digressing out of uh, your core. You know, just staying with your, with your core and getting it to conclusion. And I think the, the, the reason why many of these very well-intentioned uh, institutes or organizations you described, the reason why they seem to have lost focus or things have become watered down is because they don't, they don't stay with their agenda. Some of them dabble into politics, uh, some of them don't professionalize uh, the way they use their resources. They and they go for all kinds of reasons into things that they were not set out to accomplish. And before you know it, they lose focus. They, uh, and things get watered down. And nobody's interested in, in what they do anymore. That is what we have tried to do very well with the CIP. Stay out of politics. Of course, uh, don't be a passive onlooker. Wear things that impact on human resource management become topical, you are the very first to speak on it, but as soon as that is done and you have made your point, you return to your core area of being the, the, the institute charged with the human capital, developing people who work on human capital. So remain focused. And my charge, my counsel to these bodies will be they have to remain focused. Uh, be in the area, become best, not just good, at what they do and what they are set up to do. Um, I, 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 I think you have really hit the nail of the head, because I mean, uh, if you 
see them, they are always changing their, you have been around for 30 years, yeah. they go there, you see they are always changing their managing directors and yeah. the new um, government comes in. Okay. Let's jump straight to job hunting. Well, I mean, it's something that I believe our viewers out there would be very interested to hear yeah. from, let me say, from the horse's mouth. Jobs are quite scared right now. And given your advantage position mm -hmm. as Keshav Director of Nigerian Railways, how should a job seeker package him or herself to get the job right now? Well, again, it, it, it all depends. Um, are we looking at. Um, Not there's really Nigerian Railways. I know. Are we looking at. A, a new entrant into the job market, or are we yes. looking at those who are looking to change jobs? Because these are different. Yeah, the mid career people. Yes, the, the new, the, the new, the new, the new entrants. Um, what they have to ask themselves is what, how can you differentiate? I see many job seekers who are always very unprepared at job interviews because we. We play host to job seekers all through the year, you know, those who are trying to get into our management traineeships. And you can observe from a distance that if only this individual will do some things differently, uh, the job that is up for grabs will well be his or her. But many of them walk in very blindly, unprepared, into the interview situation. Um, Many organizations these days will need to do what we call the, the uh, computer-based test, the CBT, in order that you can, can bring down the number, because if you advertise for management tradition today, you're getting easily candidates in their thousands. And the only way you can be fair to everybody is for you to then subject all of them to a common testing program, which is uh, by and large the CBT, the computer-based test, which is more attitude, so it's not really testing yeah. uh, your professional competence, it's not testing your academic brilliance, it is about your attitude. And you can, you can prepare better for it, so that you find candidates who have not made it on this occasion, they get a second opportunity, they still don't make it. Why? Because they're always ill-prepared. Um, gone are the days when, in our days, for example, when even before you left the university campus, employers had come calling, uh, three, four job interviews, three appointment letters, even before you went up to national youth service. So that jobs were almost guaranteed in those days. Uh, that is no longer uh, the case. Now it is very competitive. Remember that um, jobs are not being created at the same rate of uh, people being graduated, graduating out of school. That means for every job that is in the offering, that is being offered in the labor market today, so many more people have to compete for it. So my advice is that you have to understand that you need to differentiate yourself. You have to be better than the rest. And when you have gone through the, the testing uh, uh, situation and you cross into an interview state, most employers today will subject you to what we call the assessment center. And the one-on-one -on -one interviews, you can easily scale through it without being found out. The assessment center is more detailed. The assessment center will find you out. Uh, it, will, it will put the worst and the best of you on the table. And you have not only the assessors, you also have the advisors. And everybody has the opportunity to, uh, to observe you for a whole day, if not for two days. And you will be subjected to different instruments. Uh, is it the leaderless uh, group discussion, or the, the, the interview session, or is it, is it um, the impromptu uh, speech making that you ask? You know, there are all kinds of testing instruments. And my advice is that candidates should be prepared. Sometimes you are sitting there, you, 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 you have before you a very brilliant 
young lad, a very brilliant uh, young lady, but just give a topic and say, hey, uh, tell us something about this topic, something that is even current affairs. They are so ill prepared. Some of them have the state fright. They cannot even face up to a panel. So these are and these are things that you can learn. You can learn to, to be better at it. You have got to be able to sell yourself better at interviews. The good jobs are still there. And many organizations these days, and I know that in Nigerian Rose where I work, it is about the best. So don't rely on that note that you are bringing from a, a, an OBA or from Asurok or from a minister. Because many employers these days will say thank you very much for the note of introduction. However, you have to compete for this available position. So that would be my advice. You see young girls or young boys and say that they are not making any effort. They say they are waiting for the ideal job. Is it some ideal job or should someone just take anything that comes along and leverage on it? You are better off telling your story to the next employer than when you are not employed. Because when you are not employed and you are sitting idle somewhere, uh, you also lose your self-confidence. You are not able to get yourself together. You always feel like, uh, even before I start, I have failed. But when you have a platform, no matter how small that platform is, when you have a job, when you are already in employment, your story sounds better in the ear, in the ears of your next employer, because they know that you have something, and that no matter how small it is, you are gaining some experience. And just being able to leave the house and go somewhere, even if it is a cottage industry, even if it is a, a one man or a one woman business, even if it is just customer service role in a very small organization, get out of the house, go in there, because it gives you, it gives you courage, it gives you confidence, it prepares you. You get to talk to people, you meet people, and you start putting things together in a way that you leverage it when you go for the real thing. However, if, wherever you are, always keep looking, looking ahead. Volunteering without being paid. Even volunteering is uh, it's, there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with volunteering without a pay. Even if it's just oh come do this for us, we only pay your transport. Fine. Just take it, get out of the house, and and the rest will be will be history. Having landed a job, how should an employee manage his or career to remain relevant and rise to the higher levels? Uh, next to that is is character, good behavior. Um, I, I tell I tell everybody who cares to listen, particularly the the new joiners. Uh, when, when, I, when I do their onboarding, that believe me, the two things that will see you through, because your employer is looking not only at what you produce, but also how you produce it. So those two things are important. What you deliver in the job, and how you deliver what you deliver. Um, so you have to work on your productivity. If you have assignments, be aware that quantity is important, yes. Quality is even more important. The quality of your assignment, of your job, of your output. Are you the one uh, who brings the output to the box and there's always a, a need for you to go and rework? Uh, do you learn from experience? Are you the one with that hunger and that passion to learn? Because when you're in um, uh, the workspace. It is not only about the assignment that you get to work on. It is also about how you observe other people do theirs. It's about how you have that hunger for learning and you're picking and adding information and putting things together. Because that is what then makes you a broad-based person. I always say to people that uh, don't expect that what you have learned in school, so as a graduate coming from the university and you have been 
studying, for example, economics or business administration. Oh, that, oh, when I then get my first job, oh, I'm going to apply everything. That, no, it doesn't work that way. You may even end up not applying more than 10%. What you have, however, is how you are able to add value to things in the workplace. Because you will be challenged from different angles. You will have opportunities to prove that you are not only educated, but that you are learning from your own experience, you are learning from the experience of just observing people do their work in the workplace. So that's a very important. Okay, so and then talking about how you grow your career. Again, um, as much as possible, people should learn that, yes, upward progression is good. I mean, it is, for example, culturally, that's what most of us re regard as uh, growth. But progression sideways is also very good. And what do I mean by sideways progression? Uh, on the same level, having the opportunity to work on different subjects. Because that then broadens your scope. And what will happen is that you have a very broad platform on which you now want to rise and grow in your career. But if you are always looking up, someday, um, things may collapse because you are not broad based. So as you look up, please always look sideways. Broaden your career and prepare yourself. Do a lot of self-learning and then look for the right opportunities. And I'm sure progression will be. Does that apply? I mean, I'm sure that, that applies in or to structured environments. What of non-structured environments like the medicine is a one-man company where there's no clear career path? How do you manage career in that same context and very brief? For a one man coming here, of course you know where you are. Uh, and you're not going to create a career step out of nothing. If it doesn't exist there, it doesn't exist. And you have to make choices. Or oh, am I staying here or am I uh, going to look outside? Am I going to grow my career outside of this organization? But if you decide to remain there, uh, then also decide that you're going to enjoy it while it lasts. Uh, even if it's a one-man company, you can you can be better at what you do to the point where the owner manager starts to see you as a potential to run that business while he goes to do other things. So don't be discouraged because there is opportunity everywhere. But like I said, the choice is yours. Do you want to remain there or you want to um, go out so that you can again grow your career in a larger organization? Yeah, that's you do your best. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. So let's talk uh, about talent management very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. But the issue of talent management comes up every now and then. Can you shed light on, on talent? I mean, when we talk of talent, are we just talking about the 10, top 10 percent? Or are we talking about the entire uh, employee pool? Talent is used loosely and it refers to the entire pool of people that you have. Some organizations will differ, they will take a different approach. And so that when they refer to talent, you're looking at um, the best of the, the, the best of the very best uh, in that organization. Uh, you're looking at the, the thinkers, you're looking at those who have the, the potential to, to rise to higher levels in the organization. You are looking at the CEO of tomorrow. So that would always be um, a small pool of, of employees in, that you would then refer to as talent. So again, it depends on how loosely or how tightly you want to define it. But at the end of the day, to be honest, every employee uh, is a target. Okay. The top 10% approach. Okay. Top 5% approach or whatever. Mm -hmm. Supposing I am not regarded as a target, what do I do? Do I just resign? No. Is there something that I can do to ensure that I make that a prestigious pool? My advice is that 
do you just resign? No, not, not because of that. Because um, from my experience, every organization also needs to keep what we call backbonus. The backbone, the main frame of the organization. Those will not be the talent. The talent will just be, like you said, maybe the top 10%, sometimes even much less than 10%. The backbone is that robust mainframe, the one that keeps the organization going day in, day out. And they have to be good as well. And also just to say that from time to time, my experience is that sometimes you are, yes, not a talent, you're only a backbone, but a very hardworking, very dedicated, uh, very loyal backbone. And you may find your space even before the so-called talent in terms of career progression. So all hope is not lost. And my advice is that, yeah, even if uh, you are regarded not as a talent boy backbone, still continue to apply uh, and to, to, to perform at your very best. Because you never know your opportunity may come. And even if it doesn't come, there's nothing wrong in being a backbone to an organization because um, backbones are also required. Not well as the talent people will still need uh, a lot yeah. of a uh, lot of uh, knowledge. So let's talk about knowledge management. Right. What um well the knowledge management today is a very hot topic. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you shed light how is knowledge management carried out in a group like uh, well for us how you are able to to capture your experiences as an organization uh, order it in such a way that going forward you can easily come back to it and use it as your starting point when confronted with the same set of issues without you having to uh, reinvent the wheel because a lot of resources, a lot of energy, time, money is wasted uh, restarting a process, a system um, that a few years back, just a few years back, was or had already confronted the organization and was solved. But because you don't capture that experience, and even where you capture it, it is in loose format, that like you cannot you cannot access it anymore because it's just lying uh, on a shelf or in a folder on your system, and there is no organized way of accessing it then it is totally lost on the organization. And that means every time you have a challenge which you consider to be new, you don't even have the opportunity to check whether you have been there before, and if you were, how did you solve it? Whereas if you have that and you can access it easily, you don't have to start applying energy I say this has never happened. So that is, in a nutshell, is uh, uh, managing knowledge for the organization. Um, how do we do it here is exactly what I have described. Uh, we try to, to, to assemble every, every approach, every solution that we had applied in, and we have it organized. So you have a library of your knowledge uh, organized in such a way that should you have need to, um, to refresh, you can easily access it. Um, okay, because we're an operating company, uh, we don't have a, a, a department for knowledge management. But if you look at Heineken, uh, Heineken as an organization, you have a department, particularly in our supply chain, uh, because the supply chain is responsible for running breweries all over the world. And the center of excellence is in the Netherlands, and you have a, a department that is charged with knowledge management, so that everything that is done in terms of solution to different challenges is very well captured, very well organized, and we don't then really have to reinvent the wheel. We just uh, access it 
and you can use it as your starting point. Of course, uh, maybe you need a slightly different approach. You can tweak it left, right, or center, but you are not starting from from base zero. Anyway, you turn. Um, people talk about uh, that they are implementing trainer said I mean implementation said they are implementing e-learning. So, what is the, the question is what is the phase of e-learning in knowledge management? Or that to, to put all our emphasis on classroom training. Uh, we encourage self-development a lot. We want people um, at their own time to be able to continue learning. Um, because the way learning is organized these days, uh, unlike in the past, for example, when I was training manager, where every learning took place, this was 25 years ago, took place in the classroom. So you had to bring employees out, I uh, gave them training, they went back to the shop floor, went back to their uh, place of work. Today, it is different. Learning, the, our learning philosophy is the 70-20-10 principle. 70 being um, how you learn, you know, observing, you know, learning uh, by yourself. 20 is uh, on the job learning, and 10% is a classroom training. Uh, and even then, the 10%, uh, you will find that you, you, you cannot deliver all the training that you want. So, in order for you to get better at it, particularly the cell development uh, component, which is in the 70%, you then have to open up opportunities for people. Everybody has um, uh, a smartphone, everybody has a laptop, everybody has this. So, people can, at their own time, go into the e library and follow a particular training. And it is designed in such a way that even in, in, in the learning department, you can keep track of what everyone is doing. Because they can also take a test, uh, they can even get a certificate for completion, and you can capture it into their training history and training record. So it's, it's a different uh, ballgame the way employees train these days. And you can, you can see that um, it opens up their horizon. Uh, it is it is limitless. I mean, what is out there in the e-learning library is so limitless, and it gives total freedom to the employee to choose how, when, what he wants to learn. But of course, with direction from the company, so that everybody's energy is channeled in, in the same direction. And as you said, they may not be busy. No, no, no. Okay, so let, let's talk briefly uh, on performance management. But this um, uh, performance is key in really um, putting the attention ahead. So how do you carry that out in the So we have to set objectives in the beginning of the year based on uh, the, the business objective. This is, these are the business objectives. How do you cascade it to different functions, different levels, uh, in such a way that everybody is working in the same direction and at the end of the year when you roll it all up then you will have delivered on the business objective so it is uh, objectives uh, determined uh, we, we set the objectives and there is a dialogue for setting objectives so it's not imposed of course you get all the guidelines and the guidance you bring it up in draft form, you set up objective setting meetings with your superior, you are agreed, and you put it on the template, much of it is, is now done online, and then everybody signs up on that. And once that is done, then the, of course there is continuous discussion, guidance, and so on and so forth, but the first formal opportunity is at the media. So at media we then uh, come back and say, okay, uh, where are we now? Because we want to avoid surprises at the end of the year. We look at it, we agree again uh, on how to go about achieving and delivering the objectives in full to the end of the year. So end of the year
year we then do the, the end, end year appraisal. Uh, end, end year discussion week comes with a whole lot of conversation because we also don't want that uh, one boss sits in his room and uh, makes judgment out of it. No, it has to be a conversation. And then uh, appraisal ratings are given. But in order that we can reduce subjectivity, what we also do is to subject it to what we call the calibration system. So we bring, uh, this is your boss, we bring all his colleagues together in one room. Your boss will then uh, propose a rating for you. But because all his colleagues had opportunity to observe you all year round, they can challenge you. Either they agree or they challenge you. Uh, but at the end of the day, the first calibration takes place and the final calibration comes before the executive committee of the company. And that's when we then take the final judgment. So for us, it's very well structured. Uh, it tries to remove and reduce subjectivity. Of course, it is still a human intervention and there's no way you can you can totally remove subjectivity. But we minimize it, we bring it to the very, the barest minimum. So that at the end of the day, uh, we know that, yeah, by and large, this has been the way the business views your performance for an appraisal year. So let's give you a wrap up and let's talk about staff motivation. Right. How do you motivate staff? What is the most effective way to motivate in, um, employees to promote their engagement? And um, uh, I mean, using a, a also an example. Well, uh, uh, you know, what is, what is important is creating an enabling environment. Don't get me wrong. Um, Pay and reward is, is interesting for employees. Uh, of course, if you don't, if your pay is grossly inadequate, you can never motivate and you can never have an engaged workforce. So I'm assuming that uh, that is that would not be an issue. You don't have to be the highest payer in the industry or in the country, but at least you pay a decent wage for a decent work. Uh, as long as that is there, what I think is even more important is in engagement or motivation is the environment of work. Yeah? I know some industry where uh, not only do people put in extra long hours, don't allow them to close until 10 or 11 p.m. on Saturday, you want them back sometimes to fix meeting for Sunday, they have, hardly have time for family, friends, or their own personal issues. Uh, and then they are sent out to go look for finance, to go look for money, uh, under all kinds of conditions. Now, you can query, you can put a question mark on engagement. So there are people there just because of their bread and butter, or they are really motivated and happy. Uh, so, uh, what is my story? What we do here is ensure that there is an enabling environment. An, an environment where uh, we can be very demanding on performance, but at the same time, we recognize that you are a human being after all, and that um, you need a life of your own. And we try to get that balance right. Uh, we create an environment where uh, on Friday, you feel a little bit unhappy that it's going to be weekend because you are not coming back tomorrow. And on on Sunday, you just have some a boost of energy. You go, oh, I'm going back there tomorrow. You know that kind of thing. An environment of friendship, an environment where um, nobody nobody is holding a stick at your back. Um, uh, an environment where you get a lot of responsibility but you also get the authority to deliver on your responsibility, where the balance is, is right. So for us, an enabling environment is the key. And we measure climate every now and again. We have one ongoing right now. We we'll do climate studies. We measure uh, satisfaction all year round on all services. So in the HR 
Carl Space, for example, almost every manager who is the head of the department must initiate a survey of the internal customers to find out, to, to, to have their feedback on how am I doing, what, how do you find my service so far. You do it twice a year, mid-year and at the end of the year, so that there are no surprises. And if something is not going right, people will tell you, by the way, they will. They can be very frontal. If they are not enjoying the services from compensation and benefits, they will say, if uh, pay, payroll, pay date is, is late, they will, they will put it in there and you will get it right there. And it's also in your objective. Yes. And so that's how we, we, uh, we run it. Um, just one, let's wrap it up. What would be your best advice to rookies and veterans alike on how to navigate their career to success? Uh, hard work, self-development, uh, preparation. Preparation is key and character. Because uh, no matter how hard working you are, no matter how resource oriented you are, if character is lost, everything else is lost. So behavior is key in the workplace and both must go together. So you can also not be uh, a priest in the workplace, not delivering on your result. Nobody is interested. Um, you, you cannot you cannot be the, the the best player who delivers every result um, but ten people are lying in hospital because of your behavior nobody's interested so you need to get both at the same level a good balance hard work result dedication loyalty but also behavior and I think that will be my closing remark. Thank you, so, so Speaking with Mr. Dr. Victor Amuibo, the HR Director of Nigerian Breweries. Um, if you wish to land a very lucrative job in a top tier organization, I advise you to put what you have learned in this um, interview into practice. You would get the wisdom expressed by Mr. Amuibo in a Facebook. I believe you have enjoyed watching this um, today's episode of uh, Experience and Next. Until the next episode, I have been your host, Paul Uduka. Thank you, Mr. Tamuibo, for coming on this